during a difficult birth, it sometimes becomes necessary to make an impossible choice. How does the medical knowledge of the maesters in Game of Thrones compare to medieval medicine? Let's start investigating this question by focusing on a specific area of medicine, obstetrics, that is, the study of pregnancy and childbirth. Specifically, let's have a look at the birth of Prince Balon, son of King Viserys Targaryen, also known as the heir for a day. The first thing we need to acknowledge is that House of the Dragon took some liberties with this scene and expanded on these events way beyond what's in Fire and Blood. In the book, this is how it goes. Thus did matters stand in King's Landing, late in the year 105 AC, when Queen Emma was brought to bed in Magor's Holdfast and died whilst giving birth to the son that Viserys Targaryen had desired for so long. The show goes into much more detail about how exactly the Queen died. Her labor was difficult, so much so that at some point one of the maesters approached the King and told him that he had to make a choice permit them to cut the child out of her so that the baby could leave, or allow the labor to continue and risk losing them both. King Viserys decides to allow the procedure, and the queen dies in childbed as a result of the blood loss from the operation. From a storytelling perspective, I thought this was a wonderful scene. Viserys' motivation was his desire for a male heir. The royal couple had trouble conceiving a child. At this point, Queen Emma had experienced five difficult pregnancies in ten years, and none of these children survived. Despite that, Viserys was convinced that this time it would be different and that the child inside her was the boy who would inherit the crown. His conviction, however, sprang from a dream, and after the violence of the birth scene, when the maester brought the child to Viserys, the queen's dead body still lying in the bloody sheets, I fully expected the maester to say that the child was a girl. But I was wrong. Just like Viserys' dream predicted, the baby was a prince. I didn't doubt the depth of the king's grief, but for a moment, it seemed like he got exactly what he wanted, only to have it taken away from him the following day, and we learn about it through a jump to the scene of Queen Emma's burial. The enormous price that Viserys paid bought him nothing but sorrow. It was a brutal reminder that there is more than one way to lose everything, and it paved the way towards his decision to finally embrace Rhaenyra as his legitimate heir a decision that arguably led to the Dance of the Dragons. Be that as it may, the question remains. Could this Caesarea have happened in the Middle Ages? As it turns out, the first record of a Caesarean section dates back to ancient Mesopotamia and is found in a cuneiform tablet dealing with the adoption of a small boy who was pulled out from the womb. The reference is not explicit and the terminology may appear confusing to us. After all, pulling is not cutting. But there's reason to believe that these would be the words used back then. The first explicit reference to a Caesarean section dates back to 715 BC, when a law proclaimed by the Roman king Numa Pompilius stated that it was unlawful to bury an undelivered woman before the child had been cut out. At that point, neither the indication of a Caesarean nor the techniques of the operation were mentioned. Importantly, as per the text of the law, the child would be cut out after the mother was already dead. Medieval scholars were fascinated with the notion that the emperor Caesar may have been born by Caesarian section. They thought that might be where the name of the operation came from. That, however, is almost certainly not the case. We know that Caesar's mother lived for many years after his birth, and that would have been unlikely if the child had to be cut out of her. Additionally, there are other explanations for the etymology of the procedure's name. A few other early texts mention caesareans. In one text, it is specifically said that twins should be delivered through a cut in the womb. But in all of these sources, a common theme is that the survival of the mother is never explicit. Throughout the Middle Ages, the church sanctioned the performance of caesarean sections, but no woman was expected to survive the blood loss that followed. Back then, the operation was only conducted after the mother had already died. The purpose was to quickly extract the child so they could be baptized in case the baby too should perish. Sort of like what happened with Prince Balon, minus the baptism part. So the show was half right. It reflects the reality of medieval medicine in that the death of the mother was expected, but it introduces a distinctly modern narrative twist. The idea of a calculated trade-off between mother and child. The moral dilemma faced by King Viserys to choose the heir at the cost of his wife is a storytelling device more aligned with modern medical dramas, such as House MD, which has staged a nearly identical scenario years earlier. There is a chance that we can save the child. 
A technique is taught at the Citadel, which involves cutting directly into the wound to free the infant. I need you to locate the C-section. Yeah, that's gonna kill her, right? But the resulting blood loss... Seven house medals. She's dying either way. We must either act now or leave it with the gods. Stay with me, Sean. You make this call, only two things change. One, yeah, you feel guilty for killing your wife. Two, your baby lives. Naomi's baby lives. Okay, okay. You're going to bring the baby out now. What about the technique of the operation itself? If you notice in the scene, it looks like the Maester is performing a vertical incision, starting under the belly button of the Queen. Later we see a blood stain around the same topography in her dress. Could this be the way a caesarean section is performed? What the Maester did is called a midline incision. It's one of many possible incisions used for this particular operation, alongside the Fanestio and the Joe Cohen incision, both of which are now preferred. The classical caesarean incision was a midline cut that went higher than the infraumbilical region, and although it is the classic incision, it does not appear to be the first one in use. The first Western text dealing with caesareans was Bernard of Gordon's Lilium. In it, he recommends that if the mother dies while the child is alive inside her, the child should be brought out through an incision in her abdomen. He does not specify where the incision should be, only that the mouth and cervix of the mother should be kept open, to allow air in for the fetus. According to a treatise by Guy de Chauliac in the 14th century, the incision should be made on the left side, since this side is freer than the right because of the liver. There are other references to recommendations of a cut on the left flank, including a particular absurd one from a German text that suggests that in men the heart is on the left side, but on women it's on the right. Those notwithstanding, there is at least one surgeon from the 14th century Piero da Gelata, who testified to making the incision along the linea alba. That's in the midline, exactly where the maester cut Queen Emma's abdomen. It's understandable that Westerosi maesters would have arrived at such an anatomically sound technique. Although there aren't many discussions of anatomy per se in the book, none that I could find anyway, we know that the maesters perform autopsies, and the ability to dissect human bodies was the single most important asset that made anatomical knowledge skyrocket during the Renaissance. Medicine during the Middle Ages was Galenic. There is derived from the work of the Greek doctor Galen, and Galen's anatomical knowledge, for the most part, for most of his contributions, was derived from dissecting animals. In the text of the Anatomy Corporis Fabrica, the influential anatomy book from the 16th century, Vesalius often pauses to criticize Galen at several points in the book for this very reason. Contrary to popular belief, human autopsies were not entirely banned in the Middle Ages. In his review of the attitude of the church towards dissections, Austin was not able to uncover any explicit records of such a prohibition, apart from a note in an anatomy text which plainly states that it is forbidden by the church to perform an anatomy of the human body. There was also a bow by Pope Boniface VII forbidding, under pain of excommunication, boiling of the body to separate the bones, which was a practice common among crusaders to bring their bones home. It may also have impacted some anatomists who use such techniques to study osteology. Despite the lack of evidence for express prohibitions, Austin does mention a permission issued by the Pope in 1482, allowing the University of Tübingen to perform dissections. Earlier than that, in 1340, Montpellier received a similar permission, so we know that human dissections were performed at least as early as that. We cannot, however, assume that this means the practice was frequent. To the extent that it was possible for science to flourish during the Middle Ages, medical science did in a few selected places, namely in the Arab world, the Byzantine Empire, and southern Italy. However, even in the prominent school of Salerno, notable among other things for being a secular institution, medical doctors would only perform dissections in animals. For most of the Middle Ages, knowledge of female anatomy seems to have been particularly limited. We know that the ability to bear a child was fascinating to the men of the Middle Ages, a fascination illustrated both by the existence of shrine madonnas and by the fact that there are many more surviving images of wombs than of male organs in the historical record. Still, the medieval understanding of conception said that female organs were little more than mirrors of their male counterparts. 
It was not until Andrea Vesalius published his masterpiece, The Anatomy Corporis Fabrica, which I mentioned earlier, that anatomy truly flourished. The importance of this book cannot be overstated. Although it is now obsolete, it remained the default treaty on human anatomy for over a century and it owes its success to Vesalius's work on actual human bodies. This translated into enhancements in the understanding of female anatomy. Vesalius's student, Gabriello Fallopio, lent his name to the fallopian tubes, the structure through which the ovary travels down to the womb. His contemporary, Julius Cesare Arantius, who was more of a practicing physician, also took an interest in female anatomy. He noted the relationship between a narrow pelvic aperture and difficult births. In his words, when it's not narrow, I go gladly to work, and with almighty God's help can often bring the situation to a happy conclusion. Otherwise, I consider it better to run than to fight feebly, and I make myself scarce. This issue, which is called cephalopelvic disproportion, is indeed one of the indications for a C-section today. It is also, I might point out, one of the possible reasons why Tyrion's mother may have died from childbirth. Several forms of dwarfism, including the most common, achondroplasia, are characterized by macrocephaly, that is, a large head. I can't be sure that that's the best diagnostic hypothesis for Tyrion in the books, though, so consider this a speculation only. In any case, similar to those 16th century anatomists, the maesters in Game of Thrones derive their anatomical knowledge from human dissections. We know that because when John first orders Sam to the citadel in A Feast of Crows, Sam is terrified of the dead bodies he will encounter there. In that same novel, Kyburn reiterates that idea, commenting on how, for hundreds of years, the men of the citadel have opened the bodies of the dead to study the nature of life. So I think it's safe to assume the maesters know more about anatomy than the standard medieval medical men. We're not like the people south of the Twins, and we're not like the people north of the Twins. In the Citadel, we lead different lives, for different reasons. There's only one detail left for us to scrutinize in that fateful birth scene. The presence of a maester in the room. Would a male doctor be present for the birth of a child in the Middle Ages? In most situations, no. Childbirth was, for the longest time, a privilege of women. Men were, in many cases, forbidden to witness the event, much like Jamie was forbidden, or supposed to be forbidden, to enter Cersei's chamber when she was in labor with Joffrey. When they told Jamie he wasn't allowed in the birthing room, he smiled and asked which one of them proposed to keep him out. According to the illustrated history of surgery, a doctor named Wert in Hamburg, fascinated by obstetrics, put on female dress and managed to witness several deliveries before he was exposed and promptly burned at the stake. Things were not always this extreme, however. On the chapter about difficult births, the trottula says to let the woman be led about at a slow pace through the house, and those men who assist her ought not to look her in the face, because women are accustomed to be shamed by that during and after birth. Well, in 2025, the trottula is a very anachronic read. Women were primarily looked after by other women, usually female relatives, local healers, and sometimes a trusted midwife, especially after the 12th century. In the late medieval period in Florence and Siena, it was customary to gift new mothers with birth rays, or desco da parto, to celebrate the successful birth of a child. The birthing scenes depicted in these objects are often composed exclusively of women, the new mother sitting up on a bed, surrounded by female visitors, while other women look after the newborn child. There was, however, one exception to the rule that only women should be present. Royal births. We know, for example, that in 1101, at the birth of her first child, Queen Matilda, the wife of the English King Henry I, was assisted by two Italian physicians. Therefore, it's historically accurate that in the births of Prince Geoffrey and Prince Balaam, there should be a maester present. Midwives would have learned what they needed, through experience, rather than through academic means. Indeed, the first handbook for midwives, a German volume whose title translates to A Rose Garden for Expectant Women and Earth Mothers, wouldn't appear before 1513. There were earlier books that treated on obstetrics, most famously Soranus's Gynecology from the 2nd century, but in all likelihood, that treatise would not have been accessible to most midwives. By the 14th century, male surgeons started co-opting childbirth into their discipline. But that process was slow, and not without resistance. 
All the way into the 19th century, the General Hospital in Vienna had a maternity wing split into two sections. One where births were assisted by doctors and medical students, and the second one run by midwives. It was there that Semmelweis conducted the experiments that would carve his name in medical history. The ward attended by medical students had a horrible reputation, with the incidence of maternal mortality from puerperal fever almost twice as high than in the other ward. It was Semmelweis who realized that the reason was that medical students came into the ward straight from their autopsy exercises, carrying infections from corpses in their hands. He made it compulsory for practitioners to wash their hands with chlorinated water before birth, and two months later, the mortality rate had sunk to 1%. In 2015, in a Q&A, George R. R. Martin talked about how he purposely made so that Westerosi medicine would be more advanced than medieval medicine. Well, I wanted, you know, I made a deliberate decision when the book began um, to have the maesters and have Westeros in general have better medical knowledge than the real life Middle Ages. Mostly because I, I didn't want everybody dying at 26. Uh, and uh, so it is, it is generally improved. The maesters have improved this, the standard of hygiene and they, they understand certain practices and they can do things better. Also though, they have magic which doesn't always work because it's magic and magic is unreliable, but sometimes it works. And, uh, you know, it brings people back from the dead and things like that. So uh, that also changes things and uh, is an adjunct to their general healing skills. Leaving the magic part aside, we have seen that in terms of procedures and interventions, the maesters seem to be on par with the late Middle Ages and early Renaissance. From Archie's interview, however, it would appear that they have more advanced knowledge about things such as how infections are transmitted, knowledge we lacked until Semmelweis all the way into the 19th century. From the show, we know, for instance, that when Sam is assisting in an autopsy, he's wearing gloves, something that Vesalius and his contemporaries never did. It is difficult to say, however, to what extent that advanced knowledge on the part of the Maesters impacts on maternal mortality. Actual figures from the historical record are difficult to determine, but in Not of Woman Born, the author estimates that as many as one in five women died in childbirth or from postpartum complications during the Middle Ages. In A Song of Ice and Fire, there are no fewer than 12 high-born women mentioned by name who died in childbed, and that must be only a small subset of maternal deaths. We must remember the words of Brienne of Tarth, when Kathleen confronted her with the knowledge that knights die in battle. Brienne looked at her with those blue and beautiful eyes. As ladies die in childbed, no one sings songs about them. Is this sort of a part to show to my multi video of this? Raise the tankard high, my friend, where tales and laughter never end. The fire roars, the elders flow in this fine hall where spirits glow. Oh, sing a tune and clap your hands. We're the merriest lots in all the land Through mead and wine our voices blend In the tavern's heart where nights transcend 